Hello, another week, another Berry Aftercare podcast. And we are picking up right where we left off last week, talking about your personal power. I spoke with a client today today or yesterday, and she said, how is it that every time I listen to one of the podcasts, I think she's talking directly to me? Well, I hope you're having that same experience, and I hope that you're sharing the links to the podcast, the Berry Aftercare podcast, with your friends and family. Also, if you're not part of the Berry Aftercare full program, please check it out at www.berryaftercare.com. Let's get going. We want to develop that personal power. Last week, we talked about how personal power can be a good thing, or power, I guess, in itself can be a good thing, or power can be used for not good things. We've all known people who have used power for not good things, and that is not going to be who we are. And some people have said to me, you know, I've never understood the exact meaning of personal power. I hear it a lot, but I never really knew what it meant. So when we're going to talk about personal power, and I shared this last time, I first learned the term many, many decades ago, actually, um, 35 years ago to be specific, when I was in treatment, because they said, you've got to learn to utilize your personal power. And personal power, as we are using it, is in the most positive sense of the word power. And it's a part of development. It's a power. It's a part of becoming the very best version of yourself in all areas of your life. So when it comes to communication, it is using your words in a way that expresses how you feel, you're, you're assertive with what you think, what you observe, and yet you're not aggressive. So it's a way to realize your goals in being your best self. When it comes to relationships, it's learning how to listen, how to be an active listener. And as I just mentioned, the communication. When it comes to parenting. It's learning how to set boundaries and be a healthy disciplinarian without resorting to abuse of any kind, including verbal or, you know, just be having your voice raised all the time, like I tended to. <laughs> but the aim of personal power is you're trying to get a grip on yourself. It's not trying to control others. It's not trying to get other people to think like you think or behave like you want them to behave, like being a control freak, which I tell you what, I continue to struggle with that. However, I'm working on it. I'm developing a healthier sense of personal power and realizing that I do not have power over other people, places, or things. So it's an attitude. It's a state of mind. It's not about manipulating. It's not about maneuvering others. It's based on feeling competent, having good self-esteem, having a vision, developing your best personal qualities, and becoming a person of service to others. So, you know, a person who has really healthy personal power, they're a generous person. They're a kind person. They're of course, they have flaws. It's, it's not about that, but it's, I have agency over myself. I choose what I want to say carefully. I choose how I want to react to things in as, in a, as power, powerful and positive way as possible. All right. So we talked about a psychologist named George Everly who said when we're talking about personal power, we're talking about, you know, we want to um, master our own emotions, not meaning we don't have them, but we learn how to deal with those in a healthy way. We want to deal with the environment in a healthy way because a lot of times, for example, yesterday I went to take three of my grandkids out on the boat. We were going to go fishing and the batter and the boat was dead. Well, internally, I'm having a little temper tantrum. Why? Because I didn't get what I wanted, when I wanted, and how I wanted it. So that's not using personal power. The personal power I utilized was thinking, you know what, I want to be a good example to these kids. I don't want to have a little temper tantrum here about an environmental situation 
that I can't control. So we pivoted, right? We went over to a pier and we went fishing off there. And those kids caught all kinds of fish. They swam in the lake. They had a great time. They didn't care if the boat ran or not. That was my personal little issue. And then we talked about a couple of different people who have more expertise in this area than maybe myself. And we were just getting to, I had two more articles and and professionals that I wanted to share with you about what they have to say. And one of these persons is Sarah Lynn, oh, I'm going to massacre this last name, but it's Muta Wasa, uh, Muti Wasekwa. <laughs> anyway, the article, and I will link this so you don't have to try to spell it or pronounce it, is stepping into your personal power. And it's in psychology today. And what she says is that it's hard not to be able to control the direction in which life goes, right? We think we're moving in a direction. What's that line that says, tell God your, your plans and listen to them laugh or something? But if you're going to put yourself out there, you know, life is chaotic enough. We often feel very helpless. We got to put ourselves out there in a way that represents who we want to be and the best self that we can be. And in this article, she makes a really good point. And I want you to think about this and be honest with yourself. She says, and I'm quoting her, okay? Most people just go through life as victims, reacting to everything that life throws at them. Now, that's an interesting statement. And she says that this is most people. So what about you? Are you one of those most people who goes through life as a victim? Well, I'm going to tell you something. A lot of people who struggle with the disease of obesity have been picked on as children. They've been ostracized from society. They've been made fun of by peers, maybe teachers, maybe coaches, maybe family members. And it might be really difficult not to see yourself as a victim. And I say that with love and compassion because if you have been, quote, victimized because of something, whether it be having over, uh, extra weight, um, having the disease of obesity, whether it's maybe missing a limb or maybe having, when I was a kid, people with red hair were really made fun of or having a body shape type that is different than what is perceived to be the current norm in society that is supposed to be the it bod, whatever it is that has made you feel left out or left you being picked on or left you being feeling like you were less than. Now, if you're a child and you experience any kind of abuse or neglect, that's another way that children start to feel victimized. And children are often victimized, again, whether it's being made fun of by classmates or whether it's some kind of an adult who literally victimized you, whether it would be verbally or sexually or compared you to siblings. That's why I think this author says that most people, not just some, she says most people go through life as victims. And I think that's kind of true. And I personally think that the reason we have catty workplaces or um, unhealthy relationships, whether it be friendships or marriages or whatever it happens to be, is because so many people are wounded. We are wounded and therefore we are defensive. Rather than being good listeners, we're preparing to protect ourselves with our words. We're going to use defense mechanisms because what we're trying to do is make ourselves look good and feel good. And so we have a whole bunch of adults running the world, supposedly, who may not be the healthiest. And they may not be the healthiest because maybe they see themselves as a victim because we learn what we live, right? And if we had a childhood where we learned that we're kind of victims, where we weren't encouraged to go out there and make mistakes and be told we were okay regardless of the mistakes we made and and 
encouraged to go out there and try things in the world, if we were overprotected or if we didn't have enough protection, if we were um, abused in any kind of way or if we were picked on by peers, then it's likely that there's at least a part of you as an adult who feels like a victim. And that is letting go of all personal power. So this author, whose name I'm not going to try to pronounce again, but her first name is Sarah Len, who wrote Stepping Into Your Personal Power, says there's a really good reason that we all need to take action towards stepping into and learning what it means to be and how to implement and how to practice this business of personal power. And the reason is simple, she said, to become the best version of yourself. Now, my focus in my professional work has been in the world of bariatrics, bariatric surgery more specifically. But I want to branch us out and talk about bariatrics in general. And bariatric medicine is the branch of medicine that deals with the disease of obesity. So whether you've had bariatric surgery, whether you're thinking about having bariatric surgery, whether you're trying to lose weight on your own or with a coach or a mentor or using medications, whatever it is, we are all dealing with some of the same issues and yet we all have our unique qualities. But we all want to learn to utilize this sense of personal power. And for a lot of people who have struggled with the disease of obesity, if you've listened to prior podcast episodes, you know that there's a sense of, you know, some people go the route of, I'm not going to say anything because I don't want to be further ostracized. So we keep our thoughts to ourselves. We keep our opinions to ourselves, even though everybody has them, but for fear of being made fun of one more time or for fear of being criticized by yet another person, or whatever it is, whatever the reason is you don't put yourself out there, whether it's sharing your thoughts or your opinions, or God forbid your feelings, right? I'm upset that you said that to me. I feel worried about you. I feel scared about this situation. The idea of sharing your honest feelings is such a frightening thing for most people. But here's what happens when we keep those things inside. We are like building up a volcano inside of ourselves or a tornado, and it's going to blow. That thing's going to do some damage because we can only keep these things in for so long. And if we don't blow outwardly, we're going to blow inwardly. And what I mean by that is unexpressed thoughts, feelings, and emotions eventually lead to physical illnesses. So we want to be our best, healthiest self. So we're going to work on this personal power, because you do want to be the best version of yourself, not only in the area of your bariatric life. And that's why we talk a lot in bariatric here about being beyond bariatrics. Because yeah, you want to get this weight to a place where you're stable. You want to be able to do the things that you want to do. You want to be able to improve your health or prevent future health issues. But you want to be your best self in all areas of life so you can enjoy life to the best, to the fullest, to, to whatever you want to do. So she gives some steps in her article. And again, I will link this article in the show notes. But she says, you first of all have to make a decision to follow through. This is really important when it comes to the world of bariatric medicine and maintaining weight. If you've had surgery, or if you've been taking medications, a lot of times it seems like you haven't had to do a whole lot in order to lose the weight, but you've got to work hard to keep that weight off. I don't care how you lose weight, you've got to put forth some effort to maintain that weight loss. So she says, you have to make a decision. You have to make the decision to follow through. And she says this is a mental preparation. You have to tackle whatever hurdles come your way. Whatever stands between you and your goal, whether that is self-esteem, whether that is people who are naysayers, whether that is being in an environment where things aren't working in your favor, like there's a lot of junk food around, or you may be working at a grocery store or whatever it has to be. But whatever stand in between you and your goal, and there will be hurdles in life that you've got to make up your mind. You're going to follow through. So stepping into your personal power, she says it's not an easy step. 
it's not an easy journey. And she says, you will fail. And if you listen to a few podcasts ago, when I talked about the book, Mental Toughness for Young Athletes, you heard about these really high power people who have accomplished wonderful things through practice and practice and practice. They talked about you've got to give yourself permission to fail. And you've got to know that there will come a time in your bariatric life or in your marriage or in your parenting or in your friendships or in your whatever it is, you're going to feel like quitting. But you have to make the decision that you're going to follow through. You're going to have to make the decision that you've got to leave your comfort zone and take the responsibility for learning new things so that you can move forward in becoming your best self engaging in your personal power. We often feel like going back to what's familiar with with our lives, whether that be regaining weight, whether that be getting into another unhealthy relationship, whether that be the friend in the friend circle who does all of the things. We have to be willing to get out of that if we want things to change. If nothing changes, nothing changes. All right. And a question she says that you can ask yourself is, Why did you want to leave that place in the first place? Why did you want to lose weight in the first place? That has to be what keeps you going when the going gets tough. So the first step of stepping into your personal power is making the decision to follow through when the going gets tough. The second thing she says we got to do is have a plan. It's not just willy-nilly. You have to know what kinds of foods am I going to eat? If you're a bariatric patient who's had surgery, there's a pretty spelled out plan for you. Protein first, healthy fruits, low sugar fruits, a lot of vegetables, a lot of real food. If you've lost weight by whatever means is working for you, you've got to have a plan. What's your eating plan? What's your eating schedule? What's your exercise routine? What's your exercise plan? Who's your support team? How do you plan to engage with your support team? What kind of accountability do you personally need? And how are you going to make sure you follow through and get that accountability? So once you make this step, I'm going to step into my personal power. I'm going to learn the skills. Then you put together that plan. And you have to be willing to make adjustments to the plan. If you're like, okay, this isn't working for me. I said I'm going to exercise seven days a week. Well, I'm finding that that's not very realistic. And that's one of the deals is setting realistic goals. We've heard that from a thousand different sources. So you've got to be willing to make small steps. You don't go from zero to 100. You do it gradually. She also says as part of this plan where we have to plan to fail and then we have to plan to keep going, that we have to plan to be kind to ourselves. This is a problem for a lot of the bariatric people I know. I was struggling last night because I got so frustrated. Even if it wasn't outwardly, I don't like that I have this kind of reaction sometimes in my head. I just want to be the kind of person who's like, okay, well, I'm just going to take everything in stride. I'm not that kind of person temperamentally. So becoming my best self, Implementing my personal power is recognizing that I'm going to have a surge of emotion. I also know it will go away quickly, but I have to choose how to deal with it when it happens. When I take charge of my personal power, I take a minute, I say, all right, I don't want to behave badly because I'm going to be a bad influence for my grandchildren. I'm going to make them feel bad or I'm going to whatever, whatever. So it's taking a minute and thinking it through and do what you got to do. All right. So. So far, we have make the decision to follow through. Secondly, she says, have a plan. Thirdly, she says, learn and research. Now, in the world of bariatric surgery, there's a lot of pre-surgical work to be done. And people think that that's where it ends. But if you're having or have had pre-surgery or bariatric surgery or are planning to, then yeah, you need to do the research about what kind of surgery, you know, where do you want to have it done? Who do you want to have to do it? What kinds of foods do you have to eat? But don't let it end after you have surgery. Because if, as anyone who has been weeks, months, or years beyond having surgery will tell you, that's when the real work starts. You've got to be able to follow through. That honeymoon phase when the weight just falls off, glory be, you know, hallelujah, sing the praises. But then if you've had surgery, 
there's going to come a point in time where the metabolic changes settle in and you will start to regain. That's why you have to have worked on developing this healthy lifestyle. So the research into how do I stay in the game when the game gets tough? How do I build my self-esteem so I don't beat up on myself with my thoughts and my words? How do I pick healthy support people? How do I um, figure out how to do this exercise thing on a regular basis in a way that's going to work for me? If you're using medications, what's the kind of lifestyle I need to have so that not only do I just lose the weight, but I build a healthy lifestyle, a routine around eating, healthy people in my life, healthy communication skills, healthy listening skills, healthy um, body, mind, and spirit. How do I develop those skills so that I have personal power in all of these areas and I'm not giving the power to the surgeon? or to the medication, or to the surgery. But I can say, I'm maintaining my weight loss because of the effort that I put in, because of the personal power that I exude. So you gotta keep learning and do the research on what do I have to do in addition to getting this weight off? What do I have to do to keep this weight off? That's why there are podcasts. That's why there are support groups. That's why there are... Uh, skills and tutorials and classes that you can take online. So you may want to improve your emotional intelligence, which is a really good thing. You may want to continue to keep that weight off. You may want to learn a new skill or develop a new hobby. So you've got to learn and continually add information. I continually, many of you continually, I'm telling you, I'm reading just as a side note because I think this is an amazing, amazing book. I'm going to show it to you. This book is called The Anxious Generation, and I am reading it, and it is phenomenal. If you have kids or grandkids and you're worried about social media, you need to read that book. It's stunning, and it will definitely help you make some good decisions for the people in your life and maybe even for yourself when it comes to social media and what happens in your brain. All right, so what she, meaning she is Sarah Lynn, who wrote Stepping Into Your Personal Power, recommends is that, you know, you set aside some time every day, whether it's 15 minutes to read or 10 minutes to listen to a podcast or there's a great um, app that I have and it's called, um, the heck is it called, Blinklist, where you can check into, by check into, I mean, like read a 10 or 15 minute summary of these new best-selling books and books on all kinds of things. And you can decide by reading the blinks if it's something you want to purchase. So if you're like, I don't think I want to, I want to get that one. So it's a great thing. And it takes 10 to 15 minutes of my day and it's great. Or I can even listen to it. So there you go. Sarah Lynn also says you need to change your routine and habits. Hello, friends. What did I say a few minutes ago? I think it was something like, oh yeah, if nothing changes, nothing changes. If you think you're going to lose weight, but continue to eat fast food all the time. If you think you're going to maintain your weight loss, but continue to eat highly processed carbs and sugar, you're dreaming. So you have to change your routines, which may for a bariatric patient mean taking a different route to work. So you forego seeing the trigger that held your favorite foods. It may mean that you have to change your habits. I know a lot of people work in the medical field or they're teachers and their schedule does not allow taking 30 minutes to eat every three hours. So you may need to figure out how do I get a protein drink or a protein bar in during that time so I don't go too long without eating. That, my friends, takes effort. Are you willing to put forth that effort because you've got to change your routines. You've got to change those habits. And if you've read Atomic Habits or if you're in Berry Aftercare, I put snippets from that book up there a lot because we have to change our habits. If we don't change our habits, if you always do what you always did, you always get what you always got. Those sayings are trite, but they are very, very true. You've got to change your habits. And you might not want to, again, go from zero to 100. A child doesn't lay like a baby and then get up and walk. 
No, they roll over, they wiggle their legs and their feet, they try to get up and crawl, and then they crawl or they scoot, and eventually they walk. And I think as adults, we expect ourselves to be able to go from, you know, zero to 100, from not knowing any Spanish to speaking fluently in two weeks. Probably not going to happen unless maybe you got some kind of photographic memory or play the piano or whatever it is that you're trying to do. You can't go out in your garden and plant seeds and tomorrow have a full array of vegetables to pick. It's not how it happens. We understand that with nature, but we don't give ourselves that same reality. We are like a seed <laughs> in the garden and tomorrow we are not going to be a tomato or whatever it is you're trying to grow yourself into. We've got to grow into it. So you've got to begin and give yourself time to grow. But you also, like a plant, need to be watered. And we water ourselves with brain food, which comes from the podcast and the support groups and from other people who are further along than we do. So whatever it is you got to do. So if you're trying to wake up earlier, try setting it for 10 minutes earlier as opposed to an hour and a half earlier. Start slowly. Whatever your intended goal is, work incrementally. And I think this is where a lot of people who are trying to maintain weight loss get into trouble because they think they need to exercise like, like a crazy person right from the get-go. And I don't mean crazy person in a bad way. I always have to kind of buffer that. But you don't, you, you don't go from being extremely overweight to being a marathon runner the next day. We have to start with something that works, which might be walking to the mailbox and back. So do what works and then gradually increase it. So I am working on, <laughs> ah, this cracks me up. I'm trying to learn to do a few like ladylike push-ups on my knees. Ladylike because I don't have the strength at this particular time to do like a full push-up for a man or a woman. So I learned in yoga to do a, a push-up from a child's pose a wide-legged child's pose. So here's my big workup plan. I do four of them in the morning and four of them in the evening because currently I'm doing a 10-minute morning yoga after which I do a plank and I do my four because that's how many I can do yoga push-ups. And then in the evening, because I do a 15-minute wind-down yoga thing, I do another four and another plank. So I'm working on building up my strength that way, as opposed to saying, I'm going to go do 25 push-ups and realizing uh, that is not going to happen, but I can do four. So that's where I'll start. Next week, maybe I'll do five, but that's how it works. We expect too much, and so then we quit. Personal power says, I'm going to start slow, and I'm going to keep going when the going gets tough. The fifth thing she says is we've got to understand ourselves. You've got to understand who you are. And we've all heard for however many years you've been trying to lose weight that this is not a one size fits all proposition. Some people need to log their food to stay accountable. Others don't. Some people need to weigh themselves regularly. Other people never want to get on a scale. Some people need to eat protein first. If you're a bariatric surgery patient, I hope you will adhere to that. Some people, you know, you know, some people like um, diet lemonade. Some people like the crystal light packets. Do what works for you as long as it's moving you forward. I have a ton of energy. I get more energy in the evening. I'm going to put forth more effort into writing and um, creating podcasts in the evening. That's when I have my best energy and I'm more concentrated. Other people, it's exactly the opposite. So do what works for you. So you've got to work on who you are. I know I've got a short fuse, but I also know that it extinguishes quickly. So I have to give myself a few minutes before I lash out to calm down and then I will be more appropriate. And my personal power, I'll feel much better about myself. And she says, you've got to get to know yourself as part of these steps toward personal power because then you can work with 
what works for you. All right. The last thing that Amy Lynn's or Sarah Lynn, S A R A H dash L E N, that's how I'm saying her name, or that's how it's written. And again, she wrote uh, Stepping into Your Personal Power. The last step that she says to take is to, and you've heard this before, my friends, stay in the present. Stay in the present. For a lot of my life, I have struggled with. When I'm working, I think, oh my gosh, I should be playing with the kids or the grandkids. When I'm playing with the kids or the grandkids, I think, oh, I should be working on this podcast. So I struggle to stay in the present moment without conscious effort and conscious attention to doing so. So you might have to work on, okay, in this moment, sometimes we're warriors, we're chronic warriors. I've been encouraging people to use this mantra. In this moment, all is well. In this moment, all is well. And the truth is, for most of our lives, most moments are going to be okay. Yes, there are going to be moments that are not, for sure. But the majority of our moments are, in this moment, all is well. And you can take that same mantra and go, in this moment, I am eating my protein. In this moment, I am enjoying my walk. In this moment, I am engaged fully in the conversation with my friend. In this moment, whatever. And choose, this is personal power, is making the choice to stay in this moment. And Sarah Lynn says, I'm quoting again, the reason we often go through life as victims is because we focus on things we cannot control. We're stuck in the past we cannot change. Or we obsess over the future that we know nothing about. Stepping into your power is mostly staying in the present. Ask yourself, what can I do now? Because you can only control now. And you can only control yourself in the now. So how about that? We often go through life as victims because we focus on things we can't control. Well, the boat won't start. Oh, woe is me. I can never have any fun. Why do things always work against me? You know what? I have those victim thoughts now and then. And then I have to go grow the F up, Connie, because life doesn't always behave as you want life to behave. Or the kids or the grandkids will be arguing. And you may or I may think, God, you know what? Why can't they just be nice to each other like I want them to be? I heard somebody say one time, and I think this is really smart too, that the reason we get angry is because we don't get what we want. Now that that's really smart. You know, I got mad because the boat wouldn't start. I got mad because the kids were arguing. I got mad because da 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 da. And if you think about it with your partners or whatever, you get mad because they're not saying what you want them to say. You get mad because they're not agreeing to do what you want to do. You get mad at work because everybody else is eating those things and why can't I? Total victim. We get mad because we don't get what we want when we want it, which is very childlike thinking. So personal power is being a healthy adult in part. So that was the information from Sarah Len. And the article, one more time, is stepping into your personal power. There was one more person that I wanted to talk about because they had really good, great information too. And we spoke of uh, George Everly, psychologist, earlier when he wrote the article, Laws of Personal Power, How to Create and Use the Personal Power You Have Waiting. So I wanted to point out some of these, what he calls laws, and he has them in quotations, these selected laws of personal power. I think these can be of great use to you as you lose weight and work to keep that weight off. But I also think these are things that we need to implement beyond bariatrics. Because yes, we want that healthy lifestyle. We want to keep our weight at a place where it prevents future health problems or reduces any health problems we may have had. But we also want to have good relationships with the people we work with. We want to have good relationships with our family members, children, grandchildren, friends. We also want to enjoy quality time with ourselves. We also want to be able to spend time alone with ourselves. We also want to be able to accept 
and deal with our feelings. They're part of life and a lot of us don't want to do that. So let's look at some of these selected laws of personal power. And I'm going to guarantee you, this is nothing new. You've heard this stuff before. It's just stated in a different way and utilized in a different context. So the context for George Everly in his article, Laws of Personal Power, was in terms of personal power. But we can use these things to improve our personal power in all areas of our life. And I love the first one. He says, the first law is be inquisitive. And you hear this a lot now. It's kind of a thing in the culture about being curious. So be confident in what you know, and I'm quoting from this article, but humble regarding what you don't know. Some of the greatest revelations have come from taking knowledge from one area and applying it to another. So in the world of um, getting a job or HR, they call that a transferable skill. So if you're able to, you know, speak your mind at work and say, this is what I think we might need to do, you have the ability to do that. You can transfer that skill to when you talk to your mother or when you talk to your spouse or when you talk to your friend. Even though you're like, oh, I can't say that to my friend. That would hurt their feelings. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. So be inquisitive. I love this. You know, when I went to this conference last week, which was the ASMBS American, AS, American Society of Metabolic and Bariatric Surgeons, it's for the professionals who work in the world of bariatric medicine. And I go in there with 20 years of experience, as do many other people. And so I know what I know, but I also know there are a lot of things about the dietary needs of a post-op. There are a lot of things I don't know about what's going on with the semaglutides. There are a lot of things I don't know about exercise and exercise physiology. Now, I'm not going to come away from there knowing everything, but I'm going to come away from there with some ideas that I can implement into what I already do know. So be inquisitive. We think sometimes we have all of the answers, and we think we have all of the answers because of where we personally came from the family we were raised in, the part of the country we were raised in, the kind of school we attended, the kind of church we did or did not attend. All of these things come into play in what we know. Well, I'm telling you, we do know some things, but there's a whole lot more that we don't know. So be inquisitive. That's why I listen to podcasts. That's why I listen to books. That's why I'm constantly learning. I even listen to a trash podcast. It's a radio show, but I learn about pop culture because I work with a lot of younger people and I know very little about that culture because I'm not a part of that generation. So be inquisitive about what you don't know. That doesn't mean you buy hook, line, and sinker and everything you hear, but you're like, hmm, I never thought of that or I hadn't thought about that in that way. So be inquisitive. All right. The second law of personal power is as you think, so you act. As you act, so you will become. Let me see. Let me write what he writes after that. I'll read it one more time and then I'll write what he writes after that. As you think, so you act. As you act, so you will become. So before I read what comes after that, I just want to say, if you've ever taken the gain while you lose class that I do, we talk about, or if you've ever been in therapy, a lot of cognitive behavioral therapists talk about your thoughts and your feelings and your behavior are so interconnected. So if I think I'm a failure, I'm going to feel lousy and then I'm going to give up on what I'm doing. So as you think, so you act. I think, why bother? I act sitting on the couch and not going out for my walk. So I become somebody who doesn't exercise. All right, here's what he said. Attitudes, how you think, what you believe, become self-fulfilling prophecy. If you think you can or you think you can't, you are right, according to Henry Ford. Or in the words of Jedi Yoda, do or do not. There is no try. I love that, by the way. 
but it all begins with the projection of confidence and competence. I'm confident that I can and can lead to the halo effect wherein people simply assume you are competent and deserve respect. How about them apples, friends? So what does this mean? This means that you're determined to follow through with your eating program regardless of what the other people at work are doing because you're not a victim. You don't get to say, oh, look what they're getting. I don't get to eat it. No, you're going to say, you know what? This is what I do. I live a healthy lifestyle. You hold yourself up. You're confident in your belief and you follow through. You act, a, you act based on your belief. It's what I do. That's one of my mantras. It's in relation to exercise. But I had a woman in the last Gain While You Lose class say, I'm going to apply that to all areas of my life. It's what I do. I think before I open my mouth. This is for me, right? It's what I do. I have my temper tantrum in my head, and then I behave like a healthy adult. It's what I do. I share my thoughts. I share my feelings in an assertive way. As you think, I think I can, I think I can, I think I can, so you act. I think I can, so I will. I think I can, and so I will, and now I'm confident because it's what I do. And I love this. This is personal power. You project confidence, you project competence. And you know, I go around in my life, and in many arenas, people have said, you know, you walk in the room and you just exude confidence. Well, because I think I can go to deal with whatever's in front of me. And I'm going to. And I believe that I can and I will. Even though, like for example, at that conference, that is not my scene, being around a lot of people where you make small talk. But I know I can do it. So I'm going to walk in there like I know I can do it and I'm going to do it. I might feel the discomfort, but I'm going to do it anyway. So you choose. You choose. I love that law. All right. The third one is fortitude is more important than aptitude. Oh, 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 I love this. And the quote he gives is, as Calvin Coolidge once noted, persistence and determination alone are omnipotent. All right, here's the deal. People who succeed, and there are a lot of studies on this, people who succeed in whatever it is, if it's like the book we read about the young athletes, right? Mental toughness, whether it's uh, the CEO, whether it's, you know, the person at the bariatric meeting who's really rocking it, whatever it is, fortitude, meaning I'm sticking with it, is more important than aptitude. We've all heard about Michael Jordan not making the high school basketball team, but he practiced and practiced and practiced and practiced. And the book we, we went through a couple of weeks ago was Kobe Bryant. He knew he wasn't the most talented, but he was willing to work the hardest. I know, I knew when I went into my PhD program, I was not the most intellectually capable. I knew I was willing to work just as hard as everybody, if not harder. So fortitude is more important than aptitude. No matter how good you might be at something, if you don't apply yourself, I have, I have a lot of siblings and they're all very, very, very intelligent, one in particular. And her life choices were different. But if she had applied herself to something like I did, who knows where she'd have gone. Now that was her choice not to. And I accept that. And, you know, it's not a judgment. It's just that regardless of what your aptitudes are, if you're born with the amazing ability to play the piano, but you choose not to play, you're not going to be a concert pianist. But if you want to be a concert pianist and you're not born with that, you can learn it. So fortitude is more important than aptitude. So if you're persistent and like we learned about from the previous author we discussed is that you get in there with that mindset that you're going to keep going no matter what. So I love that. All right. The fourth law, as you practice, so you play. This old sports aphorism applied to power as well. Both mental and physical rehearsal prepare your brain and your body for action. Now, if you didn't listen to the episodes on mental toughness for young athletes, you might want to go back and listen to it because that's what this is saying. As you practice, so you play. The more you rehearse, 
a difficult conversation with your family about your food choices or about the changes in your lifestyle, the more easy it will be to apply that when the time comes to have that conversation. The more you practice in your mind driving by the place that used to call your name, the easier it will be to do in person. The more you imagine going to the store and avoiding the bakery section, the easier it will be when you do it. So whatever it is you want to do, whether it's play tennis or what, you know, whatever it is, learn to uh, put together Lego sets. I don't know. The more you practice it, the better you will be at it. So if you're in this maintaining weight loss thing, you better be in it for the long haul because you've found out probably in the past that if you're not in it for the long haul, you're going to end up where you used to be with the weight gain. All right, number five, exercise strengthens personal power. Exercise strengthens personal power. So he goes on to say physical exercise increases your strength, your energy, your endurance, your tolerance for discomfort, and ability to learn through enhancing neuroplasticity. What the heck does that mean? And he quotes this from some research that will be also in the show notes. So in addition to building your strength, which you want to do, physical exercise, and I'm going to I'm going to take this to include mental exercise too, because mental exercises may be meaning I'm going to spend 10 minutes listening to, you know, a spiritual app, or I'm going to spend that 10 minutes listening to, um, what did I say that blink lists and listen to and learn from the information in the book that they're reviewing, whatever it is, exercise strengthens your personal power, because you develop more than just the physical strength. You develop things like perseverance. I'm going to listen to this four days a week, or I'm going to do that four days a week. It helps you develop discipline, perseverance, and I love this tolerance for discomfort, meaning, yeah, this sucks in the moment. Maybe you're jogging or maybe you're whatever it is that's stretching your comfort But when you work through it, what have you learned? I can do this. And it's the same with sitting with uncomfortable emotions because a lot of people, and this often relates to people with addictions or excess weight, because when we get uncomfortable emotionally, we turn to a substance or behavior that takes that discomfort away and gives us a major boost of dopamine to the brain. So we're not long with our discomfort. But if we're willing to tolerate that discomfort, we learn a lot of things about ourselves and we totally increase our personal power because you know what? You learn I can do hard things. The neuroplasticity is when you learn you can do hard things or you, I think I can, I think I can, I think I can, I knew I could, I knew I could. When you start saying kinder things to yourself about yourself, you are literally changing the neural pathways in your brain for the better so that you don't slip into the old unhealthy ruts. So practice makes better practice. I I don't like practice makes perfect because we're trying not to be perfect here, but practice makes improvement. How's that? All right. The next law is rest recharges personal power. How many times have you started into something so gung ho, so gung ho, so gung ho, and then you're like, oh, I'm so sick of this. I'm done. You've probably done that with diets. You've probably done that with exercise. You may have done that in trying to develop a relationship with somebody. But rest, mental, physical, spiritual, rest recharges personal power. So here's what George has to say. The acquisition and exercise of personal power expends energy, stresses the body, and may even break down bodily tissues. The body must clear itself of waste products and create opportunity for cellular growth. Rest and sleep provide that opportunity. How many of us resist slowing down or engaging in self-care or taking time to do absolutely nothing, 
probably a lot of us and maybe most of us because we're busy, 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 busy people and we have kids and we have activities and we have committees and we have hobbies and so it's difficult to take that time to rest and recharge. So my little baseball player grandsons, <laughs> and when I say they are skinny, I mean they are skinny. And we've been having weekend tournaments and these kids for two days are playing baseball, which means they're running and they're fielding and they're, and my little, my little 10 year old grandson, man, this weekend, <laughs> We had a tournament and yesterday was Monday and he was like, my legs are really, really sore. I need to have a couch potato day. <laughs> Mommy said I can have a couch potato day. I'm like, listen, dude, you need to, you need to rest. You need to recharge. You need to, you know, fuel your body. You need to sleep. You need to get ready. Cause you got another one of these next week and they have practices in between. So just like that little fella, you and I, need to rest. We also need to remind ourselves that while we rest and while we engage in self-care, we also need to get up and do the next wise thing. All right, here's the next one. And this, this guy who wrote this thing, George Everly, Laws of Personal Power, was not writing for a bariatric community. But how many of these things are relevant? Every single one of them, right? The next one, nutrition fuels personal power power. Hello. Think back to if and when you ate very, very poorly. And if you have changed to a healthier, more nutritious diet, and by diet, I mean what you consume, not restriction. I'm talking about eating real foods, eating healthy foods, fruits, vegetables, protein, you know, a variety. Nutritional fuels personal power. Not only are you going to feel physically better when you engage in the healthy, nutritionist, nutritional, nutritious foods, um, he says rest alone is not enough. The body and brain rebuild themselves using nutritional building blocks. Protein, carbs, healthy carbs, um, fat. These are the nutritional building blocks. You are what you eat, proclaimed a sign in a meat market in the early 1900s. The acquisition and exercise of personal power require energy and the building blocks and are the building blocks of physical recovery. So when we're out there and we want to live our best lives, because remember, personal power is living our best life, being our best personal self. So if we're going to be our best personal self, we better be rested we better be fueled properly. And you know from experience that the healthier you eat, the healthier you feel. There's, there's just no way around that. The more fat, the more sugar, the more processed foods you eat, the more bogged down we feel in our bodies. And it's absolutely the truth. So nutrition fuels personal power. I'm going to be at my best to have a difficult conversation if I'm rested and if I'm properly fueled. I'm going to be at my best to go the distance when I don't feel like it because it's what I do. I'm going to be at my best to be able to set healthy boundaries for myself if I'm physically, emotionally, and spiritually at my best. So this personal power thing is a whole person thing. Beyond bariatrics is a whole person thing. So it's about your whole being. All right, the next law, and there's 14 of these, and we are on number eight. Interpersonal connection is a force multiplier. Beyond the control of essential elements, you can extend your reach using collaboration with and delegation to others. Meaning we gotta have healthy support systems. We got to have healthy others in our lives. And it's true when they say, look at the five people you surround yourself with most. If they're slugs, you're going to be a slug. If they're working hard, you're going to be a hard worker. You are most like the people you surround yourself with. So who do you surround yourself and who do you want to surround yourself with? People are working on improving who they are. They're looking into, you know, the 
personal development stuff. They're listening to the podcast. They're attending the support groups. They're doing the healthy things. Or are you following the people who may be social influencers? Some of the social influencers live healthy lives in every arena. Some social influencers do not. Which ones do you choose to follow? All right. Number nine, communication is essential. According to author John Rohn, if you just communicate, you can get by. But if you communicate skillfully, you can work miracles. Totally agree. Warren Buffett said enhancing your communications may be the best personal investment you can make. I absolutely 1000% agree with this because we all talk or we all communicate all day long, whether it's by rolling our eyes or speaking language or using hand gestures, some of which are more appropriate than others, but we all communicate all the time. And I always say it's the easiest, hardest thing we do because very few of us learn to have healthy communication. There are several podcast episodes earlier in this series about communication skills. I highly encourage you to go listen to those because I believe that in order to utilize our personal power, we cannot be aggressive. We cannot be passive aggressive and we most certainly cannot be passive. So we have to learn to use assertive communication. You can change your life incredibly by learning healthy communication, which also includes being an active listener. All right, number 10, pick your battles carefully. Virtually every aspect of life has the potential for conflict. Conflict drains resources and is often predicated upon injured ego and impulsive action rather than true need or material injury. This goes back to what was being said by the previous author because victims, if we see ourselves as a victim of life and always being picked on and why doesn't anybody listen to me? We're going to react. We're going to react. We're going to engage in conflict because by God, we're going to prove that you should listen to me or I should be heard or you're wrong and I'm right. And we're going to be proving that over and over and over again. When you have personal power, you're like, let them. Let them think they're right. Let them have the last word. Let them try to engage me in battle. I will not participate. This is a huge part of everyday life, my friends. So pick your battles carefully. You will increase your personal power. Number 11, know the enemy as you know yourself. Sun Tzu wrote in his text, The Art of War. That was the quote, know thy enemy as you know yourself. If you must engage in conflict, <laughs> know the opposition. Past behavior often predicts future behavior. So if you and your partner have engaged in the same argument year after year after year, not even the same topic, but you have the same tactics as my husband and I did. It's like a dance step, right? You both know the dance steps because you know your partner and you can say, well, I can predict that if I say this, they're going to say that and you're right. Then you need to change your dance steps to one of being more appropriate. You need to change your dance steps because personal power says I can't change their dance steps. I can change mine. I can change mine. So if I know that I can rile them up and engage in conflict because maybe I don't want to look at my issue right now, then I can work them up because I know how to poke their buttons. I know what's going to get them going and I can use that in a malicious, unhealthy way. Or I can say, you know what, if I say this to my partner, I know it's going to set them off. So I'm not going to do that because that's not my goal here. I want to have a harmonious relationship. I'm going to engage my own personal power and say something more appropriate. Number 12, take appropriate responsibility for your failures and share credit for your successes. Failure can morph into future successes. Sharing credit acknowledges no one lives in isolation and builds social capital. All right, so here's what they're saying. Take responsibility for your failure. You know what? I was going to get up and exercise this morning, but I didn't get up. All right. That's my responsibility. Now I've learned that I need to do more than set the alarm next to my bed. I need to set the alarm in. I need to put my phone inside my shoe in the closet. When it goes off, I need to get up and go get it out of my shoe and put the shoe on my foot. 
I'll be more likely to exercise so I can learn from my failures. If we learn from our failure, whatever the failure is, whether it's going to be the communication failure, well, that didn't work because that just spiraled them into oblivion or whether it be in, you know, I tried to eat just one of whatever that didn't work. So I know now that I can't eat any of that. So learn from your failures and share in the success. Take share in the credit for your success. Oh, the surgeon saved my life. Yes, they performed a really great surgery and it was a successful surgery. Who's keeping your weight off? Not the surgeon, because I guarantee you they forgot your name. You're responsible for your success, but you need to share that because others are supporting you. So take some credit for your success and thank the other. When I got my diploma for my PhD and we went out to have a uh, dinner celebration with my my entire my, my family and my mom and some a sister and some good friends, I gave every one of them a diploma because they were a part of my support team. I didn't just earn my diploma. They were all part of that. So they each got their own diploma. All right, 13, one more after this. Beware the vandals. I don't understand this, but we'll figure it out because they. this is what was written. The vandals were the Germanic tribes that sacked Rome in the 5th century AD. In this present context, they are those who want to usurp your power. Some do it overtly. They're aggressive people, but most will do it in stealth. For example, frenemies. I love this. And that again was from some research. So beware the vandals. If your family members or your supposed friends or people at work are sabotaging you, they're the vandals. They are not supporting you. And you need to use your personal power to say, when you do this, I feel sabotaged. I feel angry. I feel frustrated. What I would appreciate is when you do this, I do not feel supported. When this happens, I feel angry. I feel frustrated. I feel alone. Whatever it happens to be, you use your power to share in appropriate communication how you feel, what you would like. That doesn't mean people have to do what you want them to do, but you can share what you would like them to do. But if you've got frenemies or people who are sabotaging you in whatever you are trying to achieve, you need to distance yourself in some kind of way and from some people completely separate yourself. And the last one is embrace acceptance. Know when to walk away from people, places, or quests that cost you more than they return. Strategic withdrawal can be followed by advancement in another direction, meaning if there are some people, you know, when I went into treatment, they said you're going to have to be prepared to change uh, playgrounds and playmates. Meaning, if I wanted to be in recovery from alcohol, I needed to quit hanging out in the bars. I needed to quit hanging around with people that all they wanted to do was drink. If they weren't willing to do other things with me, then I needed to move on. So embrace acceptance. Not everybody's going to be in support of you. Not everybody's going to join you in healthy communication. Not everyone is going to join you in becoming more physically active. Not everybody is going to join you in being more positive. Not everybody's going to join you in what you want done. So you've got to maintain your personal power and say, you know what? You don't have to understand or accept where I'm at, but I will hope you will respect it. I hope you will respect the decisions that I make. So there you go all kinds of great information in these last two episodes about personal power. We need to work on our personal power. I would listen to this episode again and again. I would sit down with your partner or if, if you've got you know, children that you're trying to teach them this information, sit down in 10 or 15 minute increments and listen to just one section of it with them and discuss how this fits into your life. Because if you've got teenagers, you want them to learn to stand up from the, for themselves and not go along with the crowd. So you have to engage in these conversations with them. So you've got the power. Use it, keep it, expand it, enhance it, and love it. Because the more you utilize these personal power techniques, the better you feel about yourself. And the better you feel about yourself, the more you're going to stick to a healthy lifestyle in all arenas. So again, I do appreciate your time. I know our time is limited and we have to choose where to spend it. 
So I appreciate you spending your time with me. And again, I would suggest that in addition to this podcast being about bariatrics and living a healthy lifestyle after you lose weight or as you're losing weight or as you prepare to lose weight, it's also about life in other areas. So it's beyond bariatrics. So please share this with everybody you think would benefit from benefit from it. And we'll be back next week with some more great information to help you live your best life, bariatric and beyond bariatric. Thanks for spending time with me.